Hi, welcome to Spotlight, your story, their lifeline, a mother to mother podcast. I'm Mimi. And I'm Dobra. And together, we are your hosts. In this mother to mother podcast, you will meet women sharing their stories of struggle, triumph, and hope. Our aim is to ensure that no woman ever feels alone. Through their brave storytelling, these women become lifelines for others on their own journeys. So join us as we dive into the incredible stories that inspire and empower. Welcome to Spotlight, where your story becomes a lifeline. As this is an episode featuring HG, if you are currently suffering, it may be advisable to skip the following food-related adverts. Thank you to this week's episode sponsors, Coco Bakery and Chef Mahadrin. With four prime locations in London and Manchester, Chef Mahadrin ensures that every cut of meat and chicken is packaged with care and attention to detail, and the deli food is delicious. When we spoke to the owner, he shared heartwarming feedback from customers, which speaks volumes. Many have described the deli as serving homemade food with nothing commercial about it. Customers' kids have even told them they prefer the schnitzels, kugel, and much more over their own home-cooked food. But the secret is, it still tastes like home food. And what keeps customers coming back for more is the consistency in Chef Mahadran's recipes. Customers can count on the same exceptional quality every single time. Chef Mahadran has opened a new deli counter in Kosher Kingdom, where you can enjoy their delicious fresh cold cuts cut especially for you on the spot. After all, there's no comparison to fresh from vacuum packed. Come and see for yourself. They can't wait to serve you. If you're visiting London or if you live here already, there is one place you need to visit and that is Coco Bakery, located in the heart of Golders Green. As you walk in, the smells of fresh bread and the sight of the most delicious patisseries will overtake you. Coco Bakery prides itself in being innovative, gourmet and a cut above the rest. Those that visited over Hanukkah will be able to attest to this and tell you what an incredible display, how delicious their original donut bar was. Customers keep coming back and they know if you pop in, you will too. Coco Bakery, look forward to welcoming you. Welcome to Spotlight. For this week's episode, we are honored to welcome the renowned speaker, Robertson Ruthie Halberstadt, who is a widely loved and popular speaker who gives Torah classes. Additionally, she is the author of the book titled Hyperemesis, a spiritual perspective dealing with extreme pregnancy sickness. And she has also co-founded with Janice Sugarman, an incredible support network for sufferers of hyperemesis gravidarum. We are truly excited to have her with us today as she shares her journey and discusses HD as it's otherwise known. Thank you so much for joining us today. So um, we're going to start off you know, it would be amazing. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So nice to be here. It's so exciting to have you. Could, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? Dive in a little bit on that and tell us a little bit about your background. So I would like to keep this um, podcast very specifically focused on HG. Um, HG is only one limb, one aspect of my work in the world, but definitely one of my Lekach notarities for this I was created. So... Um, I'll just kind of do what your podcast says it does, which is spotlight um, on this aspect of myself and my life for the purpose of today's interview. But yes, there are more facets of me. Thank God I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I teach Torah classes with the great attempt at depth and clarity. I attempt to teach to to access Torah on a level that's deeper and more clear. I pride myself on trying to understand Torah at a deeper level. Um, and explaining it with clarity, and that definitely is another one of my callings in life. Um, with regards to HG, my HG story, my hyperemesis story, until my third pregnancy, I wasn't diagnosed with hyperemesis. I thought I was just weak, I was making a fuss, that lots of people experience this, and their pregnancy is difficult, and welcome to the world. But I couldn't function, I couldn't function at all, I suffered and suffered and suffered. I was very traumatized as a result. And after my third pregnancy, well... Why I didn't go for help after my sec my first pregnancy was because I thought, oh, it's just a first pregnancy. It was like landing with a bump into the real world. The second pregnancy will be easier. I'll be more used to it. Um, I also thought, idiotically, that Hashem won't give me something that I can't handle. So he knows that I have a baby that I need to take care of. So I'm not going to go on birth control because I for sure won't get pregnant if it's going to be the same kind of pregnancy because Hashem knows I need to be a mother. Well, think again. Like Rabbi Zimmerman says, um, 
people say, oh, I w- it won't happen if I'm not meant to. So he says, so try and turn on a light on Shabbos and see if it comes on. That's, That's what he says. Yeah, he says, if it's not meant to happen, if I'm not meant to do this thing, then, I w- you know, God won't let me. No, try and turn on a light on Shabbos and see if it comes on. And that was a very good analogy. Like, I love that. Um, yeah. I've heard people say that when you have a medical condition or a medical danger of embarking on a pregnancy, it's like walking into a very busy road without looking. Um, it is irresponsible. So <clears throat> I was young and irresponsible. And I didn't think that, you know, um, it would kind of hit again. And when it did, I, was, I felt like I was hit by a truck. Um, and can, can you say some of the symptoms? Like what? what? Yes, it's extreme, extreme morning sickness. Um, it's nausea and or vomiting and i say and or vomiting is because a lot of people call us and they say well i don't have hg i feel very sick but i don't have hg and i say well can you get out of bed and she says well not really um kind of to the couch but not really from the couch can you shower by yourself she goes no i get very dizzy i have to sit on the shower floor um can you cook definitely not she can't step in her kitchen she can smell from her bed on the third floor when they open the fridge you know she's throwing up when people walk into the room um so um, she doesn't always throw up and she doesn't she doesn't constantly throw up. But hyperemesis is the Latin for a lot of vomiting. Hyperemesis is a lot of vomiting. So it used to be only kind of diagnosed when a woman was relentlessly vomiting and not able to keep anything down. But this is not the case. The consultants today have re-worded um, the terminology, the vocabulary for the definition of hyperemesis. And it's actually going to be printed in the next Royal College of Gynecology guidelines which is that hyperemesis is a spectrum. And any dysfunction that's caused by nausea classifies a woman as having this label called hyperemesis. So nausea to the point of dysfunction in terms of not being able to go about your daily duties, your daily activities that would normally make your heart sing, that is hyperemesis gravidarum. And it's a spectrum and it's subjective. Women do not want, to, women usually are hard on themselves. They push themselves. They don't want to um, be ill. So when you have a headache, unless it's like objectively a condition, you discredit it. You take paracetamol, you get up, you go to work. You don't, unless you're contagious, then it's not responsible to go into work because like, then I'll be catchy to other people. But if it's just me coping with myself, then this, then I just have to, then I just have to cope. Life when, just has to go on. Life just has to go on and you yeah. get, you need to have this like label that gives you then permission to say, no, I actually have this condition and I actually need to take care of it like an illness. And the consultants that were talking to us about this, they said, hyperemesis is a spectrum. We've seen women with severe hyperemesis who, dem- who never throw up, but the nausea is so extreme that they can hardly eat and drink. They're not getting enough nutrients and they're severely dehydrated. I wonder if my last pregnancy was like... So, so if, if, go on. <laughs> do we have the same question go on. i'm not sure go for no, it. if you're just feeling nauseous every single day and you don't whatever you you are running the house but you just you just feel sick the whole time it's a constant nauseous right. which i had in one of my pregnancies it was constant the right. constant nine months just felt sick the whole time right it leaves me wondering yeah Rav Moshe shapiro is at sal when who we went to speak to after my third pregnancy and he said is there a medic medication that's available to take for this condition and i said yes but it's not totally proven it's not been on the market for long enough and he said it is a chiyuv which means it is incumbent upon you it is a law so to speak spiritually to take everything that is on the market that you can reach that will help the symptoms reduce and he said the reason is he said it's important that you be happy and he said it again and again. And he wasn't a person who repeated himself. I think he said it three times. He said, it's important that you be happy. He said, the baby is developing in the environment of your body and your mindset. And just like the cells of its body you're so worried about forming correctly, if you walk around depressed for nine months, if you walk around miserable, agitated, anxious, suffering, that affects the physiological and psychological and emotional development of this child. Mm. And if you feel physically better, you will be happier. And so it's important for you to be in a happy space as your pregnancy is developing to the best of your ability. And so it's important to do all the ishtadlut, all the effort necessary to put into place all the things that you can so that you can have a better experience. And I remember thinking to myself, if I have another pregnancy that's like my others, there's no way I'm having another pregnancy in my life. But if you would tell me the pregnancy next time could be different, would I want more children? Of course. 
So I thought, okay, I've got to do the research that I need to do in order to see, is there something that can be done in prevention? And if there isn't, is there something that can be done in the management of my type of pregnancy to reduce the symptoms significantly enough to make this bearable and manageable? I don't mean it will be easy. I don't mean it will be a walk in the park. I don't mean I'll be a pregnant lady that can do pregnancy on the side like other people. It needs to be my full-time immersive activity and exercise. However, my, my example would be that when I'd done all this preparation and it took me two years to prepare adequately for a pregnancy with a lot of research, with having the medication at home in advance of the symptoms kicking in and a lot of other information that you can find on our website, hghelp.co.uk. Um, I'd done all this preparation. I'd fortified myself physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually with the infrastructure and support system practically. And I was ready to embark on the journey. And even then, I wouldn't say I was excited about it. I would say I was very, very nervous. And my analogy would be like climbing a mountain. If you think, when you've had hyperemesis before, that you want to have another child and you're just going to jump off a cliff because you want to have another child and you'll survive, hopefully, please God, somehow, then you're not ready to have another hyperemesis pregnancy or a difficult pregnancy with whatever it is that you suffer. But if you feel that embarking on another pregnancy is going to be like climbing a mountain, then it's different. You wouldn't attempt to climb a mountain without training first. You wouldn't attempt to climb a mountain with the right shoes on your feet. You wouldn't attempt to climb a mountain with extra oxygen in tanks on your back. You wouldn't climb a mountain without a guide, without a map, without a cheerleading squad. You wouldn't. But if you feel like, okay, this is scary. I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm going to climb, climb Mount Everest. And I'm one of those crazy people that wants to climb a mountain. That's not irresponsible. Provided you have the infrastructure and support system and paraphernalia in place and the tools and the skills to climb this mountain. But if you feel like you're just going to close your eyes and jump off a cliff, that's irresponsible spiritually. Yeah. And of course, everyone has to ask their own RAV and medical guide before embarking on their own journey. But it's, it's intriguing to hear your own thought process and how you approached it. Right. So what are the paraphernalia? So that became my question. What do I need to have in place so that I can do this positively, effectively and survive? without trauma. And when I'd done all that preparation, there was a readiness that kicked in that was, yes, scary, but also exciting. Like I'm going to climb this mountain and it's going to be hard, but it's going to be awesome. For the journey itself, I'm not talking about for the outcome. The outcome was an added bonus. Of course, I wanted to have another child, but it wasn't like, I'll even go through hell for another child. No, I won't even go through hell for another child. I won't die for the sake of another child. That's not what Torah wants you to go through. But and that's what it feels like, by the way. It is as severe as that. It yeah. is a real, real illness. You're not imagining it. There's a ridiculously heightened sense of smell. You don't feel, I used to try and describe it to my husband. I used to say to him, you know, I'm lying in these sheets and I'm smelling the laundry soap. He said, I don't feel like I'm smelling the laundry soap. I feel like I'm chewing it. Yeah. That's how it feels. It feels like I'm chewing it. I would say to him, please close the window. Please close the window. Someone is smoking. Someone's smoking outside somewhere. And he would look out the window and he would say, no one's smoking outside, not in our garden, not in the next door, no garden. I said, look, two gardens down. And she's like, no, no one in the next door garden. He's like, three gardens down, there was someone having a cigarette. And in my mm, bed on the third extreme. floor, I could smell. Wow, 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 wow. The, I could smell the cigarette and I was retching, retching, throwing up from the smell of the cigarette three gardens away. So it's, it's not a normal heightened sense of smell. I speak about the mystical side of this in my book. Can I just ask you, would you say that... Um, the, the way you suffered was more on the higher spectrum yes. of HD? Yes, I had extreme hyperemesis. It eased off a little bit at 20 weeks, which is quite classic. I could resume basic functionality in my life, okay. but for the first 20 weeks, no. And when I embraced it and I got all the help that I could and I was on a rigorous medication and IV schedule at home, which made me able to embark on my last pregnancy, um, I came out of my room one day and my son, who's 14, he said to me, Emma, he said, Mom, today is the 57th day that you haven't left your room. He said, I had left my room for the first time in 57 days. I didn't know he was counting. I had not been counting. I was totally fine to be there and do what I needed to do um, and manage my symptoms. I think if I would have pushed myself, got out of my bed, came downstairs, pushed myself, which I couldn't do most days, but on the days that I could have, I'd have been much worse. I would for sure have been in hospital. You said that you prepared. So all the, all the preparation, it wasn't to to give you functionality it was really it was really just for for yourself i mean um, for 57 days you couldn't come out of your room and that was with all the preparation i thought the preparation was to alleviate the the symptoms yes so that's a very important question 
The physiological condition has no cure currently, but the medication allows you to mitigate the symptoms significantly. If it's managed correctly with a various and assorted cocktail of drugs and regular rigorous IV treatments, it's like I would describe hyperemesis as an allergy to the pregnancy hormone. So the stomach cannot contain anything or absorb anything easily. It's constantly pulsating and emitting, right? Anything that yeah. you put into it. So there was, so if I was focused on having a teaspoon of fluid every 15 minutes, then I wouldn't throw up. But if I would drink a quarter cup, I would throw up. Right. And if you lie still when you're very nauseous in a dimly lit room with no smells, you're less nauseous than if you're, confronted with people and noises and sounds and smells yeah. and a moving screen sets and a, you off. it sets yeah, you off think, so yeah. if to, to diminish the triggers of the nausea right i found that citrus smells for example really helped me so very 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 pure essential oils of orange or grapefruit or lemon or the real fruits of orange and grapefruits and lemons in my room um that smell kind of mitigated and diluted other smells there's a lot of stuff that you could put into place but carrying a lemon around with you when you're in your kitchen is not going to help you know could you eat the first 20 weeks no i could i lost 10 kilos in the first three weeks of my pregnancy um couldn't couldn't eat a drink very much but whatever i managed to eat a drink i managed to keep down so the correct management of hyperemesis will make you at least retain the fluids that you're managing to get right and yeah. and men and and i was able to think of what could i eat now what could i drink now um, and in a lying down position or in a slightly propped up position, have the things and find the things that worked for me. And that was my project. My project was to stay in a happy mindset and manage the symptoms as best as I could as its own project. It wasn't so that then I can go do rota. That wasn't on the agenda. So when I was feeling better, I could sit up in my bed and fold laundry at best or paint a picture or write a message to a friend or listen to music or watch a movie or, and I'm saying that as a very religious, highly spiritually connected person. Watching movies is a very good way of passing the time where, and, and distracting you from the debilitating effects of the nausea. And there are kosher movies that you can watch. Yeah. What's forbidden to watch spiritually in a movie is immorality and violence. Now that rules out 90% of the world's yeah. videos. <laughs> but yeah. you can find the old classics and you can find nature videos and you can find documentaries and true life stories that are clean and that are kosher. And I watched many, many, many hours of it when I wasn't too dizzy to watch the screen. I was having to feel better. But the right balance of medication can get a woman to a place where she's stable and does not need hospitalization. And the right medication. And so this is really it. just to keep you out of hospital. Out of hospital, out of danger. Out of danger. Out of danger, out of hospital, and in the best mindset possible. But I say it in this order, and it's very important to understand it in this order. Your mindset is not going to mitigate your symptoms. You cannot breathe hyperemesis away. You cannot meditate hyperemesis away. The best mindset possible. I was the biggest, strongest fighter, go-getter personality before my hyperemesis pregnancies. Hyperemesis gets the strongest of us to our knees. It's not like, oh, I can cope with this. I'm just going to overcome this. I tried it with my second pregnancy and I was even nuts enough to try it with my third pregnancy. Um, but, but I was like, I'm just going to like mind over matter this. It's not possible. It's irresponsible and it's actually dangerous. Right. So you need the combination of medication, real aggressive medication um, and, and IV fluids and get the help that you need. And then comes the spiritual side of things. Now, how, what do I do with my mind? Do I fight and kick and scream and resent that this is my journey? Or do I embrace and engage and surrender to this journey and say, this is my home for the next nine months. I'm going to make myself comfortable in my bed. I'm going to surround myself with the colors and the sights and the sounds and be a home for the next generation. And I'm going to bring a piece of eternity into the world and a slice of life. And this is just a slice of time. So shifting now onto the support that you've created now for the world. So um, you... You have created the most incredible website, which is a support network with Janice Sugarman. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How that came to be? At what point of your life? Yes. So I feel that when a person works on something or begins to master something, then Hashem sends them a lot of God sends them a lot of people that are struggling with the same thing or have that thing in common to kind of join you on your journey and glean from your experience and any kind of insight or revelation that you've had. So. Um, from the woodwork, people started calling me saying, oh, I heard you had difficult pregnancies and your, your last pregnancy was easier. Was that true? And what did you do? And how can you help me? And so I began this support network without professionalizing it or officializing it. And then 
Um, Janice, who's a good friend of mine, found me also. Her daughter experienced hyperemesis, and she did in her in her in her pregnancies many years ago. And um, we set up this uh, this organization so that I wouldn't have to constantly rewind and play, rewind and play, rewind and play, and put it all on a on a website. So we created hghelp.co.uk as a website with basic guidance, mainly for people in the UK, but there's general principles there. And our aim was to educate, educate, educate. Why are you saying it's mainly for the people of UK? Why can't an American who is ready go onto the website and they get They can support? and they will get they will get guidance there about the basic principles, but the support organizations that we've networked with oh. are based in, in London. Right. So so you, if you need extra help with meals, you can click on this link. If you need extra funding, you know, assistance, you can click on this link. If you right. but that is very much for the for the demographic of a very small kind of radius of northwest London. Um even Stamford Hill have their own support organization separate to Northwest London. Um, Manchester, we haven't touched yet. I don't know what exists there. In Gator, there's a, there's a now grassroots organization, you know, setting itself up to support women with hyperemesis. It is very community oriented. Like, like I always think of the, the terminology, the term that people use, like it takes a village, it takes a village to bring up a child. It takes a village to have a child yes. with this, with a situation. Yeah. And so Sounds there's like a it. network yeah. of, right. And why, and one of the reasons that we felt that it was so important to educate is because our primary interest, our primary goal is to educate women pre-pregnancy. Because when you have hyperemesis, as a very wise doctor once said, he says, HG silences its victims. You're so weak and you're so sick and you so can't handle confrontation and, and you can't rev up your normal energy levels. That it's very hard to advocate for yourself. So getting out of bed is an effort speaking is an effort um and you just prefer to just stay in your bed and be weak there rather than get help especially if and this is this is not logical but it's it's emotionally true where you think well it's not going to cure me anyway so make all this effort go to hospital get the IV. i'll still feel sick i'll just go down from 80 percent or 100 percent to 50 percent but i'll still feel sick I still won't be able to drive i still won't be able to cook so like what's the point i might as well just stay in bed feeling in the mind yeah. yeah, I'll still be in the minus, but it's not true. It's not true. It's not true because the high risk pregnancy can move down into a low risk pregnancy when it's managed properly. Mm-hmm. And the traumatic effects of a pregnancy that was badly managed or mismanaged or not managed is so debilitating and long term in its effect that if you manage the symptoms correctly, and I say early enough, and that's why preparation is so important, then you can reduce the symptoms from you, you know, you can improve the symptoms. So let's say you're, you're in, you didn't treat this pregnancy and now you're past the point of no return and you're 15 weeks or 14 weeks or 11 weeks. And this is, and a lot of women call us at nine weeks. Hyperemesis peaks between nine and 11 weeks. So they call us at nine or 10 weeks. They've been sick in their bed already for four weeks and now they can't cope anymore. And now they want to start medication. The way I describe it is now you're at minus 50. The medication will take you to minus 10. If you take the medication before you hit zero, just when you're reducing in your functionality, it can keep you above the zero. It'll keep you categorically different to how you normally are. Your normal self is not this new normal self, which is a half around as a self. There's different rules, different systems, different personality almost in, 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 in a haparamus sufferer. But there's a way of managing that and will keep you above the minus. But if you get yourself so badly depleted, so much depletion and disintegration and deterioration physically in other areas then the medication will only lift you out of the minus 100 to minus 50 or minus 40 and of course you won't feel the the benefits so that's why education is important prior to pregnancy sitting down with us having a consultation or looking at the website and making an appointment if you need one afterwards to discuss and assess is this responsible can i handle this and the way rabbi zimmerman put it we met with rabbi zimmerman the the federation bethlin in london and he said, when assessing whether a woman is, where that's a responsible thing to take on, having embarking on another pregnancy, when a woman has a condition, is to assess four areas. And he says, even when a woman doesn't have a condition, a couple should think clearly through the following four areas. Her health now, her health gestationally, the husband, in other words, the marriage. Can the marriage handle this, right? And can the children handle it? Can the other children handle it? And there's even an opinion in Torah that says that the mitzvah to have children is a mitzvah to look after the children you have as well. Another pregnancy of mine, I was done. I was really done. And my parents sat me down and they said to me, Ruthie, we want you to know, they live a few streets away from me and they have very, very busy lives. They sat me down and they said, Ruthie, you know, if you ever wanted to have another child, we will parent your children. Wow. They wow, said, wonderful. 
They said, we will parent your children. They said, you shouldn't think that it's that if you want to have another child and this is all going to land on us and we'll pick up the pieces because you need us and, and so you don't have a choice. Like, this is so important to us and this is so valuable to us. That if you wanted to climb this mountain again, we will parent your children for nine months. And they did. And if I didn't have that in place, there is no way that my, my last child would be in the world. Mm -mm, no mm -hmm. way. So, so I feel like that, that's something that a family needs to take into consideration. Can you keep your, your judgmental family at arm's length if you have judgmental family? Can you create infrastructure and support from somewhere else that will give you permission and fan this to a flame and make this something that you want to do? There was no pressure in my parents' comment, by the way. I don't yeah. feel like, oh my gosh, I ought to now. Not yeah. at all. It was such but a it was beautiful just a, thing for them to say to you. Stunning. It's yeah. just, I, honestly, mm. I have tears. Yeah. <laughs> it really moved me. That is so beautiful. Yeah. They said, we'll, we'll parent your children. And they're amazing parents to my children. They didn't step in from Australia. They lived around the corner. My kids yeah. know them and love them. Yeah. They, we, my, we, we try and aspire and long to emulate my parents' kind of parenting. It was a step up of education for my mm. kids, not a step down. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a compromise. Yeah. So, I, so I don't have to agree with that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing pretty well. Yeah. No, but I'm saying that that was one of the big factors for me in, in a guilt-free reaching out for help that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had that conversation so that and was very special and this is and this is where the book came in at one point where did that, where did um, that? The what's book, the story behind the book the book is interesting the book um a big rabbi who we went to speak to um in my first pregnancy just wanting to understand why pain in pregnancy and why pain in general if god creates the world with purpose and meaning with reason with with a message to us then what's the purpose of pain it just makes you kick and scream hide in a corner disintegrate like why yeah. is he putting me through this? And why pain in pregnancy? If I'm doing something so meaningful and incredible and bringing life to the world, why is it so, so blinking hard? Yeah. And he said, he gave us a lot of amazing answers. And he said to me, do you, do you write a diary? Because I came with all my notes of my questions to ask him and attack him, basically. <laughs> and he said, do you write a diary? And I said, no. And he said, maybe you should. He said, it could help women one day. He said, he gets a lot of women who suffer. And if they feel validated, which is why I'm here, the validation that people feel from hearing someone else who thought their thoughts and felt their feelings and struggled their struggles alleviates the pain somewhat. And he said, just for that, you should collect your diary entries and you should print them one day because it'll help women who are going through what you're going through. So I began to write with that in mind and to seek answers with more of a fervent kind of desire to the questions because I thought, well, maybe I'll give this forward one day. Maybe my experiences will become a lesson to someone else's path. Um, so it was at the back of my mind. I'm saying I wrote, you know, 10 years of diaries that helped me in other ways as well, but I documented my questions and the answers that we got and the inspiration that we received and the guidance we were led by. And that formulated itself into a book, having a father who's a master author and kind of, you know, writer himself really helped. He was very encouraging of this and he edited my book. We'll be right back to this episode. Hi, I'm Danielle. And I'm Aviva. And we are the founders of Mother to Mother, an organization that supports and empowers women on their motherhood journeys. We offer a wide range of services to make sure that every mother can thrive, from emotional support services to mother and baby groups, practical help, health information, community kitchen, and more. Mother to Mother builds communities of women to support each other. By tuning into our podcast, you have joined the Mother to Mother family today. Welcome and enjoy the rest of this episode. He helped me enormously. I wouldn't be in the world if not if not for him. Your eighth child. Um, my seventh. No, oh, yeah, yeah, my eighth child. Eighth yeah, child exactly. now. The book the was the eighth child. Oh, 100%. 100%. It's like a birth. Um, it's not like a pregnancy. It was not like easier. a pregnancy, though. Not no. like my pregnancy, no. but definitely like a birth. Um, and yeah, he really, he really helped me with it. So the book contains three sections and these are the three sections that any person needs to confront when they suffer. And this is why it's generic to all suffering. Okay. My inroad to suffering, my access point was through my hyperemesis flavor, but it's all ice cream. Mine was chocolate. Yours was vanilla. Yours was mint and yours was pistachio or whatever, but, but it's all ice cream. Suffering is world renowned. It's like people saying stress. I know what you mean when you say stress. My stress is from different reasons and for different causes and makes me feel perhaps different to your stress. But I know what stress means, right? Pain is a generic, universal, international, you know, experience um, that everyone goes through on some level. And so when I was asking these questions and getting these answers, it helped me on many fronts. And it became some of the stuff of my lessons, my classes, 
my my um, recordings and my lectures that that I was giving to people suffering with other stuff. So the three areas to confront when a person suffers are practical. And that's why it doesn't help you to meditate. That's what I'm saying. When you have pregnancy sickness or any illness, you need to go to hospital. And so this HG is no different. Don't be a martyr and get the assistance that you need. Practical assistance. And that then stretches also to the rest of the people in your dependent circle. Your husband, your children, the infrastructure and practical support needs to be addressed before finding meaning in pain. Okay, so that's practicals number one. How can I feel better? How can I reduce the symptoms? How can I cope? How can I cope? You can reduce the symptoms to the point that you can cope. You won't necessarily thrive. You won't dance through your day, but you'll cope. And if you're not coping, then you need to get help because there is help to be had. Mm -hmm. Number one, practical. Number two, emotional. I'm, I'm coping. I'm not feeling terrible like I'm dying, but I'm crying all the time. And I'm just miserable, miserable, miserable. You need to get help with that as well. You know, when people say, um, when you're suffering, you just need to dig deep and find the strength. No, I say you need to ask for help. You don't need to find the strength. You need to get help. And that's one of the purposes of suffering, actually. The deep interconnectedness of soul level contract that happens when a person is in real need and they go for real help connects people in a way, in a way that's so deep and not superficial. That is one of the purposes of creation. The interconnectedness of all the flames of every human soul is one of the purposes of creation. And people kind of know this, and that's why we live in societies, and we realize that for my physical functioning, I need other people. When I turn on the tap, I think about the hundreds of people that are involved in me drinking a cup of water. And so we choose to live in dense cities where we're reliant on each other for so many things. In our physical functioning, Torah says this is true spiritually as well. Just like the infrastructure physiologically, physically is necessary for all the body parts to work together, all humans need to work together to create a greater good and even to raise yourself into the biggest human that you can be, you need other people. So when you get advice for some, from somebody else, you feel vulnerable, you feel weak, you feel needy, you feel insecure perhaps because I should have the answers to this myself. But then when you gain the wisdom from the other person, you don't carry the other person with you your whole life, you received a gift from them that it then expanded you. And in them you contain, in, in them is contained a little bit of you and in you is contained a little bit of them. And a gift that you parted with but interconnected with. And there's this harmonious, stunning musical symphony that emerges or beautiful painting or whatever imagery you like to, to think of when we interconnect. So that's really one of the purposes of suffering. So when you need help, go and get the help because that person who you're going to for help is going to someone else for help, for something else that they need. And everybody is fragile and vulnerable and weak and needy in some area so that we're forced to drive ourselves outside of ourselves and get from other people and give to other people. So people will have different weaknesses and different strengths so that we interconnect. So that is the second category, the second area that I discuss. And that is don't be shy to go for help. Um, acknowledge your weaknesses. You'll have strengths in other areas that will benefit other people. Um, when you're in a strong place, you'll give it back. You'll gift it forward forever. But now you need to go for help. Go for help. Um, 100%. And I can point to tens of people that are responsible for the lives that I've brought to the world. 100%. I can say this child's in the world because of. Mm. This is, and I, say, and, I, and I look at those people and I say, this is your child, and this is your child, That's and this is your child, and this is your yeah. child, because without you, this child wouldn't be. Okay. Wow. And without you, this child wouldn't be so resilient because I was resilient. And this child now has a backbone that's stronger emotionally because you helped me. 100% that child, and I, and I see it sometimes, people who are energetically attuned, they look at my child with a love and a, and a care that they feel because they helped me in that pregnancy. So your seventh child was really attached? Um, all my children are. <laughs> they're, all, they're all attached. <laughs> they help me all the time. But yes, definitely a strong a strong tats and a Halberstadt component. My in-laws were incredible too. They live around the corner in the other direction and they cook That's meals amazing. and they had to, thank God. I mean, thank really God, thank God. We're very, very, very blessed. And to me, it felt there was another contributing factor in my feeling of, of like people say seven kids. How did you have seven children when you, are you mad? And I say, yes, I'm a bit crazy and a bit amazing. I'm a bit amazing and I'm a bit crazy. But I felt like there was a calling for me to have those children because Hashem had cocooned me with an infrastructure and support system that facilitated it. Every single pregnancy was extreme. Yeah, the first three were badly managed, like I said. Right. But then actually it was an amazing doctor who, who said to me um, that I had this condition. I'd never heard the terminology before. I didn't know that I had a condition. Um, 
I just thought I suffered more than most people. I'm just thinking now for somebody with their first pregnancy, so uh, orthodox religious girl, she goes to color lessons. And so a first pregnancy can really be until they get the infrastructure yes. or even know that because they don't know they have hyperemesis. Yes. They, they don't know anything. They're going yes. on their first journey, their first dream, and suddenly they're stuck in bed. I'm thinking about um, girls that get engaged, uh, who get married, and become pregnant two weeks into their marriage. Sure. And they can be bedridden sure. for the first nine months of their marriage. And, or, or however long it takes until the symptoms alleviate. About, for, about 20 but weeks, yeah. It should, it should this awareness not be in color lessons? Yes, we've been giving out little flyers of our website to be included in the color teacher packs that they so give, important. like, like you know, a card that goes into the color pack about Hana organization that deals with infertility, mm. if you struggle with so intimacy, if you struggle mm. with whatever it is, yeah. this is what's normal and this is what's not normal. Um, it just says hyperemesis, you know, extreme morning sickness is not normal morning sickness. Mm. Like if you, have debil- if you have any kind of debilitating dysfunction as a result of your feeling sick, um, don't think that you're just not that resilient. Like get help basically right. and we're putting that into the color teachers packs and we're putting it into Hassan teachers education and we're trying to write yeah, a letter actually, for rabbis Hassan teachers probably is more important than the colors because when somebody's in the oh, moment yeah. they're just yeah. breathing through it they're just yeah. trying to they think that oh this is normal this is pregnancy this is yeah. what everyone talks about the pregnancy goes but actually it's the husband that yeah. is the one that's actually more logical yes and is more aware at the time yes. and so really that is yes. so important yes. and- so that's why I've written this book because I wanted there to be awareness out there not just for the woman herself but for the mother for the mother-in-law for the next of kin the sister the cousin the auntie we get calls we get messages sometimes from saying my very good friend is going through this how can I help her it's the advocacy of other people around that need to be the ones who are well versed and knowledgeable once the person is in it they feel like they've been hit by a truck you know run over by a train whatever analogy you want to use and they can't actually help themselves they can't read they can't navigate a website they they need other people to read it and get them the help that they need for them as soon as the baby's born do the symptoms go away straight away? So in most cases where the pregnancy was treated like it should be within 48 hours, I would like embrace everything too soon sometimes because yeah. it was so euphoric mm. to feel normal and have a baby. It was just like, you know, just euphoria. Right. That makes total sense. Yeah. So the first category is practical assistance when you suffer. The second category is emotional, emotional assistance and guidance and and stamina and stability and the third category is spiritual and that is usually to be addressed mostly only pre-pregnancy in other words why why do i need to go through this why is it important why is it meaningful why suffering why me all the whys and the torah says there are answers to these questions it is deeply significant it is deeply meaningful it is hugely constructive not destructive to experience the suffering that you're going through. And it's tailor-made and designed specifically for you with intention, with calculation, with no mistakes, no coincidences. You need to be exactly where you are right now, doing what you're doing and experiencing what you're experiencing. And when you get the clarity on this topic, then it transforms your experience. But the terminology that I would use would be you have to fill up in the years of plenty for the years of famine. If you're stronger before you go into it, then you have a trampoline to bounce back off. The, the, fab, the fibers underneath you are connected and whole and you don't lose the plot psychologically and spiritually. It's very hard to reach out for this kind of understanding when you're in the depths of suffering, but it is still possible. You need to read the book and I'm not just saying that as a sales pitch. Yes, yeah, so can we have a teaser into what you say about preparing yourself spiritually in the book? It is deeply meaningful, deeply constructed to your feminine psyche, to your individual person and to the world. When you engage this willingly, wantingly, knowingly, understandingly, not this as in the pregnancy sickness, but all the curses of women, which are this reconstructive, very painful, but necessary heart surgery, right? That saves your life. The pain that's, a, that's in existence in the world is, is, um, is, that, is that rehab surgery. The person walking around um, a few days before his open heart surgery looked fine and happy. And then he goes under the knife. And this surgeon, to someone who doesn't understand, is a cruel idiot what are you doing putting this person through so much pain no i'm saving his life you wouldn't attempt it if there wasn't hope the pain in the world the pain in existence the pain in creation is there to reconstruct and build something that without this wouldn't be 
as the painful but necessary life-changing procedure, life-giving procedure. And when you understand it, especially if you can understand the mechanism of what is being affected by me experiencing exactly this, then I don't say you engage it like, oh, I can't wait. It's still hard. The sages said, Lohem Belaiskaram, keep suffering and keep the reward because it's still so, so great. The, the pain is so great. However, when you're going through it and you feel like this is my calling and it's meted out with exactitude, one of my favorite Gemaras is a conversation that Eov, Job, had with God, where he says to God, Maybe you mistook me for Oyev. Maybe you read my name wrong. Maybe you thought, My name is Eov, Job, but you read it Oyev, which means enemy. Maybe you thought that I'm your enemy, and that's why you're giving me all the suffering. Because really, I'm not your enemy. I'm really a very good guy, and I want the best of, of everything in the world, and you shouldn't be punishing me like this. He so was God known, said He to was him, known to have a really, really hard life, and yes, a lot of struggles. He, yes, he suffered the full extent of suffering that yeah. a human being could ever suffer. Yeah. And he turned to God in tremendous faith and, and commitment, and um, achieved enormous things spiritually. But one of the, it, 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 as part of his journey, he said to God, well, maybe you made a mistake and you're meeting out the suffering in my direction because you think I'm, I'm your enemy and I'm not your enemy. And God said to him a whole long response, very, very beautiful response with the Gemara goes through it. And one of the things it says is he says, do you think, he says, do you know, God said to Eov, do you know that no two hairs on your head grow out of the same follicle? Do you know that no two raindrops touch each other? I who make the rain fall. I see to it that no two raindrops crash and no two hairs grow out of your head of the same follicle. You think I'll mistake you for someone else? A human being, a living soul in this world, with their, with their circumstances and the, and the people and the events and the skills and talents and the missions and struggles and sufferings that you're going through in your life, you think it's not exactly tailor-made with exactitude? For you to achieve what you need to achieve and build what you need to build you know and to me that's very very significant and meaningful there's nothing random wow that's incredible so if anyone wants to hear more they'll have to go by the book yeah maybe i'll finish with one last thought and that is that when i was suffering in my pregnancies my subsequent pregnancies when i knew what this entailed um i felt like i couldn't pray i couldn't pray to god for making it better because i felt like i'd been an idiot in getting myself into it in the first place. And I said to my father, who's a world-renowned spiritual Torah teacher, um, and he, I said to him, you know, Abba, I said, I feel like I can't daven, and I feel like I'm suffering because Hashem is mocking me. Hashem is saying to me, you got yourself into this hole, so eat your socks. You didn't have to. I didn't want it from you necessarily. Now that you got yourself there and you're not coping, so you thought you were equal to the mm. task, you're not. It's your fault. And that is the case with sins, for example. When you dig a hole... And you get yourself into a rut because you went down a bad path. Then you lose divine assistance. You can still come back. You can still heal. But you need to first recognize that you made a mistake in getting yourself into there in the first place. You don't say, God, why did you put me there? You put yourself there. Are you with me? Yeah. Totally. Right? You can't say, if you squandered all your money and now you're poor, you can't say, God, why did you make me poor? You made yourself poor. Yeah. Now you say, God, I was an idiot. Please help me. Right. Yeah. So I was in that, I was an idiot, please help me place. Like I thought I was equal to this. I thought I could climb this mountain, but actually I've fallen. I've grazed my knees. My hands are bleeding. I'm, I'm stuck in a rut. I can't lost your I can't, oxygen. I've lost my, uh, my oxygen. My sneakers are, you know, leaking and like, you know, and it's my fault. Like now I'm halfway up this mountain. It's my fault. So Hashem's mocking me. He's laughing at me. He's just like, you thought you were equal to it. You should have walked around the lake. You shouldn't have climbed the mountain, mm. you know? And, um, and my father said to me, that's not true. And he said, the reason it's not true is because you're doing a mitzvah. He said, in taking on something that's irresponsible, when it's neutral and therefore your choice, in other words, it, it's fine to do it and it's fine not to do it, right, is different to when you're doing something that is aspirational and spiritually great. And therefore, if you did the effort that you needed to do to put into place and be responsible in embarking on this journey, and you thought you were equal to it and you wanted to do the right thing and therefore you walked this path and then you lost, you lost the plot, you can't say God's telling me that I made a mistake because you did it with the right intentions for the right reasons with the adequate preparation in advance. So it's not a mistake. Why are you suffering? Because there's a bigger picture. <laughs> yeah. There's a bigger picture. Maybe you need to correct this 
through through the endurance and still having faith in the situation maybe this child needs to you know come through this kind of pathway whatever it is you need to go through what you're going through but for, it's for different reasons not because you were irresponsible god forbid that's an important thing to understand i think we can wrap this up yes. it's such an honor to have you here today it's actually really uh, i'm like it was really interesting. Speechless. Yeah, it's completely <laughs> speechless. I want to hear more. That, that third component, <laughs> really, I feel, is what's relevant to everybody. And if you're listening to this and you never experienced the sickness, then you need to know that pain is meaningful and struggling is significant. And you need to try and work out what it is that this struggling is teaching me that I couldn't have learned otherwise. That's really my, like, for this I was created message in the world that's a dominant factor in my life. Like, don't just cope thrive you know don't don't just don't just exist like dance yeah you know dance through your challenges dance through your through your experiences embrace them learn their lessons connect to god through them don't sign out of a relationship because it's hard hard isn't always bad hard can be very constructive and powerful and meaningful and good and like what you've done also share with others and help others educate others give awareness to others if you can Right, and if you can just validate others, then that's a yeah. that's a really good start. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, don't judge, don't impose your situation on their situation, don't project your coping mechanisms on their coping mechanisms. Be there, hold them, hear their pain, hear their suffering. You don't need to have gone through what the person is going through to really give them permission to experience what it is that they're experiencing, and that's hugely helpful too. Thank you. And once the baby's born, mother to mother are here. Exactly, Dava. <laughs> Thank you. It's so true. Mother to mother are here to hold your hand once the baby's born. <laughs> Amazing. If I had to summarize, I would say, please acknowledge these three facets, these three areas that need acknowledgement in suffering. A, practical assistance. And again, if you're not in crisis now, but you're preparing for something difficult, ask yourself, what's going to help me in that situation? What could help me? What could make it better? What could make me cope? Number two, emotionally. Am I resilient enough emotionally to endure this without my marriage falling apart? without my parenting in terms of a loving way falling apart. It must have been really hard for your kids. I was able to maintain my equilibrium in my bed, in my room. They couldn't always even come into my room, but they could stand at my door. They could talk to me about their day. They could, I was totally present for them. And my husband often reminds me of that. He's like, we don't need your colors. We don't need your, your, your shopping. We don't need you anything. We need you to be in a happy, present, energetically available space to mm. hold your family. And when you can do that emotionally, even if your body is suffering, you can be still happy to be in your skin, in your, you know, you're not happy to be in your skin. But you're, you're still giving. You're, but you're able to be in, in a resilient space emotionally. Even though my pregnancy was very, very difficult, it wasn't traumatic to the point that I would say, I could do this again. Wow. Like, you know, if yeah. not for my age and stage of life or whatever it is, I'd be like, yeah, it's doable. It's a very, it's a very intensive marathon. But people who are crazy run marathons. People who are crazy climb mountains. It's very intensive. But it's, but it's doable. It's doable. That's what I mean about emotional. And the third thing, again, I could speak about all of these all day, but the third thing is spiritual. Find the purpose and meaning in your spiritual calling in your own life. And that will make your heart sing. And that's what transforms a difficult experience to a meaningful experience that you've chosen. Um, there's a series that I've given recently. It's on an app that someone sponsored me to set up an app with my classes called um, Ruthie Halberstadt. It's free to download. And there's a series there on on all all of suffering called why things happen it's a three-part series that's a very in-depth study of the torah sources of the purpose of pain and suffering in life in general and that's the spiritual intellectual academic philosophical um route that a person who seeks more meaning and more understanding and what it is that they're going through can learn basic principles from the last thing i'll say which i forgot to mention is that we created a website for um guided visualizations that janice did um, which is when you can't control your body, you can control your mind and you can go to a place of holistic calm. You can release tension with guided visualizations and meditation. Even if you're very, very inexperienced in doing this yourself, there's some hand holding exercises there. The third one is specifically for HG. Um, and that's, that could be a very good tool, very good resource, but I'm saying this last for a reason, not because I forgot this will not cure your medical physiological conditions. Get medical assistance. Get the help that you need. You cannot meditate this condition away. But once you've got everything down to the minimum minimum that you can get it to, you've, you've mitigated the symptoms to the best possible, you still won't be having a laugh 
So meditation in that place can really help you harness the power of your mind and climb out of your body to some extent and get a bit of respite. And that's super, super helpful and meaningful. Really, really transformed my experiences in a very real way. Very, very real way. Lots of love to you all. Good luck. May you never suffer. May you know only joy. Lots Amen. Of love. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening to this episode on Spotlight. If you are affected by any of the challenges we have discussed, then please visit www.mtom.org.uk forward slash podcast for guidance on where to find help. Do you also have a story to share? Be in touch if you'd also like to be a lifeline for others by sharing and empowering women across the world. Podcasts at mtom.org.uk. Thank you.